Um, a shadow really can only exist by obstructing light. That's physically how a shadow happens, and that's the same emotionally, or the same spiritually, the same as anything. In my world, the only way we create shadow is by obstructing our light. So we get to explore and examine what is obstructing us, what is creating the shadow. Was im Schatten liegt, ist unbewusst, ist also ein Teil von uns, der nicht gesehen und gelebt wird. Weil aber auch in jedem Schatten das Potenzial des Lichts steckt, liegen da gewaltige Ressourcen in uns verborgen. Deshalb ist Schattenarbeit der Weg, ganz zu werden, der Weg nach Hause. Also die bewusste Auseinandersetzung mit den unbewussten Anteilen in uns, nicht nur ein wesentlicher Teil meiner Coaching-Arbeit, sondern auch ein ganz zentrales Thema im heutigen Podcast-Interview mit Tom Slater, mit dem ich dir einen weiteren meiner Wegbegleiter vorstelle, die ich in Bali kennen und schätzen gelernt habe. Herzlich willkommen zu 1000 First Steps, deinem Podcast für das Größte in dir. Mein Name ist Jakob Horvath und ich bin Tom im Rahmen eines Retreats begegnet mit dem klingenden Namen Dojo, das er in Bali leitet. Und wenn du mit dem Begriff Dojo ein bisschen vertraut bist, dann weißt du, das ist der Raum, der Space, wo Kampfsportler ihre Künste trainieren. Also da geht es schon mal auch körperlich auch ziemlich hart zur Sache und das ist auch beim Dojo Retreat passiert, also das war durchaus, äh, gab es da Situationen und Momente, wenn du da als Außenstehender dazugekommen wärst, hättest du wahrscheinlich die Polizei gerufen. <lacht> das Retreat ist mir zugeflogen. Es war eine dieser Gelegenheiten, die mir Bali auf dem Silbertablett serviert hat und es war wirklich ein Geschenk in der Nachbetrachtung, weil als ich davon gelesen habe, bin ich so neugierig geworden, allein schon aufgrund der Energie, die dieses Retreat ausgestrahlt hat. Wo ich noch gar nicht genau wusste, was genau ist das jetzt, was mich da so anzieht. Aber ich habe dann mit Tom einen einstündigen Call vereinbart und danach habe ich ganz klar gewusst, so ein ganzes körperliches Ja, so ein Full Body Yes, das Retreat ist für mich, da muss ich hin. Und ich bin nicht enttäuscht worden. Und Toms ganz spezielle Energie hat da eine ganz wesentliche Rolle gespielt, dass ich das schon im Vorfeld so gespürt habe. Du wirst im Rahmen des Interviews jetzt gleich merken, was ich meine. Wir gehen im Interview genauer darauf ein, was das Dojo Retreat so besonders macht, denn tatsächlich habe ich so etwas noch nie zuvor erlebt. Und eines kann ich jetzt, zwei Monate später, eindeutig sagen, die ganze Erfahrung hat auf einer so tiefgründig verkörperten Ebene stattgefunden, dass ich meine wahre, authentische Kraft noch einmal in einer ganz neuen Stärke kennengelernt habe. Und im Interview erfährst du auch, wie du die Essenz dieses Retreats in deinem Alltag, in deinem Leben umsetzen kannst und auch tagtäglich dir selbst näher kommen kannst, ohne dass du dafür auf ein Retreat gehen musst. Tom ist 50 Jahre alt und seine verkörperte Weisheit, seine Teachings und vor allem die Art und Weise, wie er diese Teachings selbst praktiziert und lebt, inspirieren mich sehr. Und ich hoffe, dich auch. Wir sprechen über seine schwierige Kindheit und wie Tom die kaputte Beziehung zu seinem Vater liebevoll wiederbelebt hat. Du erfährst auch, wie du deine Schatten durch die Beziehung mit anderen erkennst, insbesondere natürlich in der Beziehung mit deiner Familie und den Menschen, die dir am nächsten stehen. Wie du diese Schatten dann integrierst, sodass du die Ressourcen heben kannst, die dahinter liegen. Außerdem gehen wir tief in der Frage, warum es überhaupt keinen Sinn macht, das Leben meistern zu wollen, sondern wie wir die Kunst erlernen, uns vom Leben meistern zu lassen. Wenn dir 1000 First Steps gefällt, tust du uns einen riesen Gefallen, wenn du uns eine 5-Sterne-Bewertung auf iTunes hinterlässt und die Folge mit deinen Freunden teilst. Gerne als Story auf Instagram, als Screenshot, das funktioniert immer besonders gut. Wenn du dann auch den Link noch dazu gibst, können deine Freunde direkt dorthin gehen und die Folge sich anhören. Danke schon mal dafür, dass du uns da unterstützt, den Podcast noch mehr Menschen zugänglich zu machen. Ja, abonniere den Podcast unbedingt, um keine neue Folge zu verpassen und schreib mir deine Gedanken zum heutigen Interview sehr gerne auf Instagram at jakob.horvath unter dem Post zur Folge. Außerdem, wichtiges Announcement an dieser Stelle, sind ab Mitte Juni wieder zwei Plätze frei für mein Deep Dive Programm. In der gemeinsamen Coaching-Reise begleite ich dich persönlich und individuell, je nachdem, was deine Themen sind, deine Wünsche, deine gewünschten Outcomes, deine Ziele und wie tief du eintauchen möchtest. Für drei bzw. für sechs Monate. Du lernst dich selbst und deine authentische Wahrheit in einer völlig neuen Tiefe kennen und lieben. 
Gemeinsam lösen wir alte Konditionierungen und innere Grenzen, die dich da vielleicht noch davon abhalten, endlich für all das loszugehen, was dir wirklich am Herzen liegt und zu entdecken, wer du hinter all dem wirklich bist, was du bis jetzt vielleicht geglaubt hast zu sein. Und wenn du da jetzt eine Resonanz spürst und Interesse hast, mehr zu erfahren, dann buch dir einen kostenlosen Discovery Call mit mir unter dem Link in den Show Notes und ich freue mich, dich kennenzulernen. Und jetzt wünsche ich dir viel Freude mit Folge 115 und dem Interview mit Tom Slater. Dear Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad you're here in this Beautiful garden here, my place in Bingi in Uluwatu. Happy Thanks. to have you on the podcast. It's an honor, really. It's an Thank honor. you. Good to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We've been through a journey two weeks ago, the Dojo Retreat, your, one of your like, heart projects, or work that you've been doing for many years now. I'd love to dive deeper into that and what's that all about, and uh, also sharing some of my experience with that. But first of all, how are you doing today? You just arrived here in Uluwatu from Ubud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing good. I love Uluwatu. Um, I f find it very open and receiving and giving. Um, so Ubud is, f Ubud, for people that aren't familiar with Ubud is quite, for me anyway, is quite dense. Mm. There's a lot of kind of like, kind of cavern valleys with <clears throat> jungle and it feels quite like you're being embedded into something and this feels much more open and mm. so yeah I, I always feel really received when I come to Uluwatu and also we have the ocean literally there so yeah you yeah, can actually great. see it from here if you yeah. look over the wall <laughs> and I love the ocean so. yeah. yeah me too what do you love about the ocean um yeah I just had a long relationship with the ocean uh -huh. Um, I was a diver for seven years, mm. so I kind of had, I always loved the ocean since I was a kid. Mm. I grew up near the ocean in Scotland, and um, but it wasn't very friendly. I didn't really interact with it much because it was so cold. Very different ocean than yeah, here in Bali. Very different. So w as soon as I came across tropical ocean, I just couldn't get enough. And mm. I loved the kind of... The surprise of putting your head under the water with a mask on and having this whole world revealed, which mm. you wouldn't have realized from the surface it just looked like this flat kind of featureless landscape and then yeah. suddenly there's a membrane and you put your head in and somehow there's mm. you know there's this huge thing revealed so mm. it became a big exploratory journey for me yeah. you've been a, a free diver too right yeah i've been a free diver since i was 17. um now i'm less trained than i was in my 20s and 30s i was mm. kind of training quite a lot for it um, and I found it really useful a practice in terms of kind of being very present and meditative mm. because one of the things with freediving is um, the deeper you can go, the calmer you are, the deeper you can go in mm. a way or the longer you can stay underwater. So it's more to do with calm than adrenaline, mm -hmm. um, which I really liked. So it's very meditative and um, I just really loved that feeling of just kind of floating mm. into the depths, into the darkness and surrendering essentially mm. yeah beautiful so. beautiful what else do you want people to know about you what's what's a life for you these days who is tom mm. well um yeah i guess it's been a long journey in terms of i mean life for me is this unfolding experience um, and I'm learning every, every day. I'm learning something new. I'm learning from meeting new people, from meeting you and learning um, from receiving life and for, mm -hmm. for interacting with life. Um, and yeah, this last year, for example, I've learned so much about myself in new ways that I had not perceived that were there. And it's been really mm -hmm. very grounding for me. Mm -hmm. um, so for m my sense of this experience is that it's it's something i'm kind of like expanding into and i'll, I'll keep doing so um mm. and i i find a lot of joy in it too um i don't want to take it so seriously as a kind of like i need to cling on to something mm. and identify so much with that yeah. it's it feels more it not not necessarily orientating around happiness or joy but at least experiencing it lightly mm -hmm. and um kind of allowing it to mm -hmm to unfold 
I remember you saying in the retreat, actually, happiness doesn't interest me. Mm. And that stuck with me. I even put it in my notes mm. as a quote of Tom Slater. I was like, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Why? Why not? Well, it's not that I'm anti-happiness or against <laughs> happiness. I think happiness has a beautiful place, as, yeah. as does joy, as do many things, mm -hmm. um, you know, ecstasy and so on. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, things that we would seem or seem unfavorable to us also have equal place at the table. And for me, it's about like just allowing what's there and not kind of favoring and clinging on to something and orientating ourselves mm -hmm. around happiness, for example. Like, mm -hmm. I really just want to be happy because it's favorable to me. I don't really learn or stretch or grow th from my happiness necessarily. In some ways I can, I can learn definitely from that, but there are many ways I can learn. And also I'm really open to, to my anger, to my grief, to my sadness, to, to lots of things that would be seen as less favorable and more challenging. Mm. So for me, my optimized condition is not to be clinging on or pushing away anything, but just allowing and feeling what's there. Mm -hmm. and just being with what what I'm present with um, without kind of feeling like I'm pointing myself in any particular direction as a, as a destination that I want to kind of strip out all of the unfavorable things or mm -hmm. work through all of my shadow. Mm -hmm. No, I am my shadow. I have a shadow as part of who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something that I, oh, you know, there's a point where I won't have shadow. There's a constant unfolding of my, of my shadow, of my blind spots, mm. of my truth. And so, it feels more holistic that way for me as a way of being. Right. So let's dive just into that shadow work, which is part of your work, what you're doing with your coaching clients. And also it has been a, like, has, uh, been a huge part of the dojo retreat, I feel like getting in touch with those parts of yourself that you have suppressed for a long, long time in your life for whatever reason. And we might want to go into that deeper to um, give a clearer understanding, maybe what that could look like, actually, you mm -hmm. know, when uh, unconscious uh, stuff is, is actually at work every single day in our lives. And we just don't know what it is mm -hmm. because we have not done this kind of work. So what's a shadow? Well, a shadow is anything that has not been fully expressed, for, for example. Um, but there are many different ways of approaching shadow. You have mm. conscious and unconscious shadow mm. as well. So you would have potentially, you know, shadow can also be something that would potentially be seen as positive, something that would essentially be a way of calling you into a greater aspect of yourself or interacting mm. with life that mm. you're holding back because mm. you're afraid of success, for example, or that what would it mean if I fully stepped forward and fully kind of lived into my potential? So we can have shadow around potential too, but it's anything that's unrealized and we can have unconscious shadow and we can have conscious shadow. So unconscious shadow is things that we've suppressed from an early age Mm. And we put into a kind of dark pocket in our being that we're not fully aware of that are kind of, is kind of running the show. So it's kind of like a low level hum, anything up to something quite acute. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't, if we're unaware of it, then we're unaware of how it can um, essentially, you know, use us, run us, um, influence us, manipulate us to a degree. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if the more we become aware of it, the more we can kind of befriend our shadows then in my sense, we can still have shadows, but we can be much more conscious mm -hmm. about them. We can be much more aware of like these are aspects of me that I, you know, we don't necessarily reveal all of ourselves by any degree mm -hmm. with somebody else. So it's a, a, about how much we actually have agency over what we share and how we share it with people. Um, so a shadow, unconscious shadow would be something that we just aren't aware of. Um, and often it, it's dictating our behavior and that can lead to all sorts of things that can potentially lead to, you know, dissonance in our relationships and uncertainty and um, things like that, which, you know, we can feel things are happening to us when actually there's some mm -hmm. truth in that we have a lot of skin in the game mm -hmm. around the choices we make and the things that we mm -hmm. um, get involved with with or how we respond to things or react to things that can often come from shadow. So mm -hmm. a good example of shadow for a lot of people is anger. Um, a lot of people have a very suppressed um, 
field around their anger. Mm. Um, and the reason why that is, is because for many people when they were younger, they were told that they shouldn't be angry. So something came up when you were four or five years old, okay. you expressed anger in some way. Um, maybe you had a tantrum or something and it was seen as oppositional to your parents' will. So your mm. parents were trying to do something and it wasn't a good situation for you to do that or they just felt it was very oppositional mm. so they told you never to do that like that's not you're not acceptable like that this is not allowed you don't behave like that stop it mm. and if that's strong enough if that's a strong enough energy then the person will clamp down on that particular thing that aspect of themselves and anger has a place in the world it's it's needed it's power it's life force etc and so then we clamp it down on it and it becomes a kind of shadowy aspect of ourselves that we don't really have any maturity over because we we contract the power or that expression at the age in which it's um, we shut down. So normally it can be between four and eight years old mm. and then we carry it through our lives as a suppressed form, but it still comes out, it still leaks out in reaction especially in intimate relationships or when we're triggered or something something on the outside of us will instigate something where we yeah. we get angry and we react and then again we're reminded of that it's actually unfavorable because first of all the response probably is not positive mm -hmm. to our anger mm -hmm. and secondly a lot of shame will come up because we're told that actually it's a bad part of us it's yeah. an unacceptable bad part of us mm -hmm. which is totally incorrect Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a story that we've held a lot of our lives and mm -hmm. we've identified then in that I'm a nice guy, I'm the peaceful person, I don't get angry, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. So what's the potential there when you build a more healthy relationship to your anger and release the bullshit that we've been told what anger is or what it is not and what is acceptable about it? When we stay with that example of anger, because I feel like it's something that many people can relate to. Yeah. Um, way more life force way mm. more capacity to be able to show up with our power mm. with power in general mm -hmm. um with our own sense of our own relationship to power that yeah. we demystify this idea about power being something negative um that it's somehow tied in with the egoic expression and that is actually needed in the world we need we need power we need also need anger at certain points we need people to be able to stand for something um, and stand in something rather mm -hmm. than against something mm -hmm. to a degree. Also having good boundaries, being able to say no um, and being able to stand up for ourselves um, is really important too. So mm -hmm. if we don't have that capacity to be able to say no, for example, which because no becomes a fearful proposition because it can be in resistance to other people and we're afraid of rejection. Mm -hmm. So by saying no to somebody, we reject and therefore we fear rejection. Mm -hmm. um, so people don't have good no's and that leads to all sorts of complications. And if I can't trust your no, I can't trust your yes. It's really mm -hmm. simple. Like it, if you keep, if you keep saying yes to me, and there's a no building inside of you and you're swallowing all of the mm. no's, that's really untrustworthy for yeah. me. Yeah, how authentic is the yes yeah. when the no is not owned? Yeah. And, like you can't express it. It either. cannot be authentic yeah. to, to a degree. I mean, there are yeses that we can say that are obvious no-brainers, but there's, there's a point where we're you know, transgressing a boundary we don't even know is there or that we need mm. um, just by yesing our way into something akin to mm. resentment. Yeah. And boundaries such an important topic how would you know where your boundary is when you never allowed your anger to actually come up and tell you hey this is there's a boundary here you mm -hmm. said something that's upsetting me here's an anger but i suppress it and i just swallow and i take it all in and my boundary is somewhere like two meters behind me sure and i get like overrun by life circumstances all the time and people yeah. are not respecting me and i feel like i'm not respected why not mm -hmm. what's wrong with me mm -hmm. well nothing's wrong inherently right it's just i haven't learned to own my emotions mm -hmm. and the authentic power that lies within that owning is that a correct way of understanding what you just said yeah i feel like if you don't have a clear sense of your boundary eventually you will have a boundary there will be a boundary somewhere within you and at some point you'll need to execute that boundary mm. Um, but usually if you don't have a clear sense of that boundary, then it will be way too late. So it will probably be very hard and intense. And so someone who's exploring in relationship to you mm -hmm. um, will be 
potentially very surprised by a sudden boundary that comes up because you're basically wanting to open and wanting to share and wanting to be um, kind of compassionate and receiving of somebody and then suddenly there's a very strong no and that's usually a strong indicator that you know you haven't set a more healthy boundary way mm -hmm. further out which mm -hmm. is way more um, kind of you can be heard without raising your voice you can be mm -hmm. felt without bringing intensity and so forth but we don't know how to set those boundaries because for a lot of people boundaries are very very strong mm -hmm. and they're usually protecting something very vulnerable so there's a vulnerability inside of us that needed the protection of our power the power was held so the power had to grow into a very strong boundary and what's within that is something very delicate and unresolved immature and not grown up it's um it's a very it's like a little seedling essentially is that why we need to protect or why we feel we need to protect it because Sometimes. it's not able to protect itself yeah yeah that would be a good example i mean there is it's quite nuanced but yeah as a generalization that mm. would be true so if we can figure out what that thing is and we can give it enough nutrients enough light yeah. which would be effectively bringing it from shadow and bringing it some mm. light and some nutrients from mm. above and also you know giving it the right soil conditions so that it can go into the darkness and it has the possibility to bring roots into the into the darkness because darkness is important mm. just as much as light and we have this unfavorable thing yeah. around darkness and so when it can establish itself then it can get stronger and stronger and stronger mm. and also then it can it can bring balance it can mm. be you know the tree in some sense is mirrored underground in its root system as overground in its branches right? right so then you have a stronger sense of that then you wouldn't have no need for a boundary or a protection you wouldn't need to defend yourself mm. so somebody could then bring anything that they wanted to around their perspective on the way that you are and you wouldn't need sudden you wouldn't have the kind of urge to defend yourself you could mm. hear them out without being triggered without feeling that, like your character was being questioned yeah. um, that it was somehow devastating for you that the person saw you that way and you'd know clearly in yourself that your truth and you could hear them mm. and maybe take parts of what they were saying and go, oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting perspective, yeah. but I'm not going to be undone by your perspective. Mm. You know? So that could be perhaps um, a potential that so many of us really desire to not being triggered that often anymore. Like when you go through life and you can just be more relaxed and you can be at ease and you can just you know be, be more peaceful in general and not just feeling you're not worthy when some person says x y z or mm. feel you're not good enough or you have to whatever the limiting belief is so it's really all about resolving the root causes mm -hmm. through owning all of the range of emotions and working with it mm -hmm. and that's how you shine the light on your shadows um yes yeah, essentially it's exploration it's an exploratory process in mm. terms of you know self-development self-discovery mm. we explore um a shadow really can only exist by obstructing light that's physically how a shadow happens and that's the same emotionally and the same spiritually the same as anything in my world the only way we create shadow is by obstructing our light so we get to explore and examine what is obstructing mm. us what is creating the shadow um, and kind of re-identify ourselves in some sense with it that we start to really explore that part of us mm. and that we don't deny it and say oh this is something else mm. you know it's, or project it on someone else or project it on something else yeah yeah uh, shadow projects as much as light projects and mm. we can you know we orientate ourselves in cert in a certain sense that our shadow will fall on on things yeah and that can distort the way that we perceive things mm. just as much as if we do the opposite you know if we become obsessed by light and we've got unresolved things then mm. we can project a lot into that space mm. that's um not fully realized in terms of of truth um or of authenticity yeah. In your opinion, is, is that what happens oftentimes in the spiritual world, spiritual scene, you know, the obsession with the light, the obsession with 
everything is love and light and we all run around and be happy and joyful and, and, and blissful and that's the ultimate goal, that's the destination we work towards, that's why we meditate, that's why we practice yoga, that's why we transform all our, our stuff and heal all our wounds, but ultimately it's just another egoic thing to achieve. Mm. And oftentimes it's not really going inwards and really facing also the darkness, facing also the shadow and integrating as part of ourselves. What's your opinion about that? Well, I think, um, you know, a lot of these practices are, are very ancient and there's a lot of reverence I hold for like yoga, meditation and so on. Mm. And there's a lot of amazing new practices that are coming forward that you know, have lineages, ancient lineages like breath work, plant medicine and so forth that are really interesting. And one has to be careful around how one approaches all of these things because mm. if we do orientate ourselves towards that transcendent experience and we are seeking some kind of um, like state around, you know, bliss or we're, we're looking for something and we're trying to reach for something in that way and we're not we're kind of saying, oh, this is like we're polarizing the experience in terms of like orientating towards light and so forth, then mm -hmm. it's, it can be very um, destabilizing. And then we need a heavier and heavier um, daily practice in order to feel like regulated around ourselves. You know, there's a lot of people who are kind of living in despite of something when mm -hmm. actually they could be much more liberated um, rather than just, you know, kind of having a four hour morning practice or something along those lines, mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, because there are, there's a point where we, we're called into shadow. We are called into mm -hmm. a deeper truth. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are ways of approaching that and it's, it can be quite a long, arduous mm -hmm. journey. It's mm -hmm. not something you can undertake in a week or a weekend or. Yeah. And you would know. Uh, from your own life experience, when was a time in your life that you might want to share where you were called into a deeper truth, where you were faced with a shadow or a part of yourself that you just felt like, okay, this is, um, this is real, this is serious, um, and now you're actually also aware enough to follow that path. Is there like, obviously it was a process, it was a journey anyways, but mm -hmm. Is there some remarkable event, some remarkable time in your life where you feel like, okay, that was a shift, that was a, a real turn in your, in yeah, your life? Many, many times. Yeah. Many, many times I've been in situations where I'm, I'm in a particular perspective. It becomes increasingly uncomfortable in that perspective. I start kind of gaining some awareness within that to realize that there's something that I need to look out, out with that perspective. Mm. Um, and I start to get stretched and I get edgy because there's an edge. I don't feel comfortable and therefore there's something there that's pulling me into something beyond my own zone of like expertise or, you know, where I feel like I'm, mm. I know what's going on. It's like a not knowing. For example, when was the time in your life where you have many? Happened? I mean, this, even this year I've been, I've been in, in a situation this year where I, I didn't re like, I knew that there was something in the kind of early formative years of my life that was mm. to, to a degree um, kind of prescribing an experience around safety in relationship, int intimate partnership, where there were certain conditions under which I felt unsafe um, and that I didn't really know why until maybe a year ago where my mother revealed to me that as a baby for the first eight months of my life, she resented me because of the pain that she felt I had caused her during childbirth because she was denied an epidural. So she was denied any kind of medication. Mm -hmm. So she experienced fairly short labor, but it was very painful and she didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So she basically um, related to me and um, uh, kind of um, held a relationship with me of resentment for the first eight months of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I then became very unsafe i feel in that situation because i didn't mm. i didn't have a place to go i didn't feel like i had landed in the world mm -hmm. um, i wasn't really held i wasn't really acknowledged in the way that i should have been really as a little baby yeah and so in partnership if that came up if i felt unacknowledged or um not 
fully landed in the relationship, this feeling of unsafety came up. And it was way more proportionally it was way more than it was actually happening it felt out of proportion so I knew there was something there and it kind of felt like life or death like there was a point where I really felt like you know very desperate and uncertain mm. and then then when I was triggered in that then my articulation went almost to zero I was just in this kind of raw state of expression mm. like survival essentially mm. um, so that's what it is for a child basically yeah survival completely yeah, yeah. so then that was within the last year that's happened mm. to me you know and so it's taken me it took me 49 years to mm. come to that awareness you're 50 myself. now i'm 50 now mm. yeah and so there are many points in my life where the, i've had realizations like that in my teens i was just angry i was so angry or so mad at my dad mm. um i was really um just yeah i was really upset and hurt i was very hurt And the way that I related to him was from through anger. And it's how I felt we had a deep connection or some kind of mm. relational dynamic around intimacy was to be angry with him. Mm. Um, so I used to pick fights with him all the time. Mm. And I wanted to get into a physical confrontation with him in a way. I wanted to like, I wanted us to hold each other, but the only way I could see that was to be kind of like physically um violent to him or with him mm. and that never happened thank god i just mm. used to break stuff around him and <laughs> and cause a lot of arguments between us yeah. and i didn't know what was happening i just felt like i just felt just really compressed mm. and and uncertain and desperate and you know slowly through time i started to realize what was happening it took me mm. the best part of a decade and a half mm -hmm. for that one to really start alchemizing um mm. truly And, you know, through my 20s and into my 30s, I moved through a lot of that. And especially in relationship to my dad, to the point where now we have this beautiful relationship. Mm. Um, you know, it's not what I want it to be, but it's what I need it to be. It's yeah. very much um, us meeting each other, like meeting him where he's at. Mm. Um, you know, he's not capable of showing up in the way that I kind of fantasized that he would, you know, in this yeah. kind of dreamlike ideal of him, you know, suddenly opening his heart and being very um, kind of compassionate and emotionally mm. intelligent with me. That was, mm. that was never the, the truth of what would be there. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I feel I personally can relate. Like I, I did not have like a similar story like, like yours, but I feel like Uh, the relationship to our parents especially we want them to be any different than they actually are we want them to be more this or more that or especially when we grow up and then we feel like okay now i understood it now i want you to understand it and why don't you understand it right? uh, and yet from having healed and i feel it was a deep healing that took place also in the relationship with with my past the relationship with my parents became like such a beautiful, deep connection, a friendship-like connection yeah. that I'm so grateful for now. And I can relate to what you just shared. And I think many people can, even if they are at the moment still in that position of where there's resentment or resistance or anger or, or some unresolved stuff from the childhood even maybe. Mm -hmm. What was your, what has helped you uh, to reestablish that connection to your dad or what could be a recommendation and advice perhaps that you could give if if there is still unresolved issues with parents and how to through working on yourself and becoming mm. more aware of what's going on inside of you how could you invite your parents maybe maybe invi an invitation is the good word because mm. not changing them but inviting them into the conversation into that process mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, the key was um, resolving the relationship in my own body system, mm. um, in my nervous system, in my thinking patterns, in my emotional field, in my heart, um, in my energetic field mm -hmm. with my parents. So mm. for me, that's a process of individuation, which essentially is um, like, yeah, essentially it's a process of r resolving the unresolved. So a lot of people have very unresolved issues with their mother and their father mm. and they will try and resolve them through relationship so we we're quite often orientating ourselves to partners that remind us of one of our parents in a way that's not resolved so oh, that we get to unconsciously yeah 
So we get to play that pattern out with a partner and we try and resolve it through relationship and it becomes very sticky. Which does so, not work, right? What's that? Which does not really work. Usually. No. Well, it, I mean, it can, but you need to be very dedicated, devoted and open mm -hmm. um, to be able to navigate that one. It's a tricky one to navigate because yeah. any contraction, any trigger, any blame, any thing along those lines and as soon as there's kind of finger pointing or something it becomes very complicated mm. and we can get lost in that it's so you actually one. maybe pointing the finger not on your partner but on your mother or on your father sure. that's what actually happens yeah yeah and quite often we're blaming something on the outside that is we fear on the inside of us mm. so my fear of my father on the inside of me was his violence towards me mm. his aggression towards me that i knew i was capable of because when i was a teen i proved it i mm. proved that i was capable of the same mm. in a way and it was kind of payback time mm -hmm. you know but i was holding this resentment in my body because it had been shut down at a young age because it was seen mm. as unacceptable had been dominated and had been essentially beaten into me by my dad yeah. Um, and disciplined and you know w was given a very heavy structure around it so slowly individuating from that and working through lots of different layers of anger and so forth then I started to resolve that relationship with my mm -hmm. father inside of me mm -hmm. and there was a point actually because my dad's voice used to be very present in my head through my 20s he would be very present as a judge um, in the background, you know, pointing at everything I was doing and kind of saying, why are you doing that? And you're not doing this and, mm. you know, just picking everything apart. And there was a point where I realized that it had gone, that that wasn't, it wasn't a specific moment where it died. It just, I took a while to catch up to the fact that it wasn't there anymore. Wow. So then I was like, oh my God, my dad's voice isn't here anymore. Wow. And You know, I even try to usher it in, kind of like, you know, mm. go on and give me a comment. And there was nothing. There was just silence. And, and it never came back. So when you met them, when you met him the next time, how was that? Like, how well, did the that voice was on the outside of me then. Uh -huh. His voice was on the outside of me and some different part of me was more open to receiving mm. me. It was no longer reaffirming something on the inside of me um, that was, you know, un unresolved or judgmental. So the trigger was gone. The trigger was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, there were other triggers, <laughs> for sure, <laughs> but that particular trigger, which was a huge one, uh -huh. um, where I felt like not good enough and I didn't feel welcome or accepted yeah. by him, that really, really softened out. Mm. And then slowly through a process of that with my mother too, mm -hmm. there's been a process of individuation and it mm. continues. I mean, mm. it's an ongoing process, mm. but the more I individuate from them or with them, the more they see me more clearly rather than, you know, a, a prodigy, rather than a product of their genome, rather mm. than something that they created um, and are responsible for, they mm. start to see me much more as an individual sovereign human being and that my choice making starts to make sense to them and that they, there's more clarity between us and more respect. Mm. Um, and what I see, you know, a lot of people have issues with their parents um and you know we can go through the whole life with holding certain stories and narratives and positions and stuff with our parents and this to me that is some of the deepest work mm. is this unresolved aspect of our relational dynamic with mm. the kind of primary male figure characters that we had when we were formative in our years that were incredibly influential over mm. us that dictated to a degree that we held as godlike, then human-like, then fallible, which is a kind of journey of the, the child, essentially. Mm. Um, that if we can resolve that in ourselves, then we can be beginning the process of, of liberation, which mm. for me is, it's all of this stuff is around liberating ourselves, yeah. freeing ourselves up from cons constructs and constraints and very narrow mm. bandwidths, mm -hmm. because often we're seeing things and hearing things and feeling things through a very narrow frequency. Mm -hmm. And the more we can open that, the more that aperture um, gets dilated, the more we can feel, the more we can see, the more we can taste, touch and mm -hmm. sense in the world. Um, and then this whole instrument can come alive. We're not just front loaded here with so much, which is attributed to the eyes when the whole body can see. The eyes look, the body sees, the whole body as in the energetic body and everything, mm. you know. And so that, for me, is all of this process is around liberating and opening to something mm. and to life, essentially, to allow life in, to let life in. 
let life in, open up to life, feel more alive, mm -hmm. have that human experience actually fully, mm -hmm. not just part of it. Yeah, what is a human experience? You know, this is a big question. We have a certain, again, very, we can have certain constructs and stories and narratives around what it is to be a human being. Yeah. Like, and what it is to be a functional human being in, you know, a three dimensional reality. Um, it's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly complicated. And a lot of, there's a huge amount of unknowns in that. There's mm. a huge amount of possibilities and exploration in that. And for me, yes, there's a possibility and an openness for some transcendent experience for sure, because that's part of our humanity is that we're also, there's a, there's a point to multi, multi dimensionality within us. Um, and there are many layers to us. And the, this is also, there's a complexity to that, but the, the, just the physical nature of our being. And the fact that we're in this experience that we don't really fully mm. understand mm. and we constantly try to interpret it and measure it and all of this mm. kind of stuff, but it's, it always eludes understanding. We can't fully grasp this thing, mm. um, to any degree. Mm. Um, for me is, it, like, is what I'm interfacing with every day, every moment of my life is, is a combination of, um, putting my energy into the world and receiving life and energy from the world into my body, mm. into my energetic body as well as my physical body. And that was basically the core of the dojo retreat, if you can put it that way, the, the heartbeat of what we did seven days long. And I have tried to explain it to a few friends and family and people who asked me, hey, what have you guys been doing for seven days out there? Mm. I said, you know, it's really hard to explain. <laughs> yeah. And it's, mm. at some point, if someone shows up and does not know what's going on there, um, he would probably call the police. Because mm. it was wild at some mm. point. Maybe you can describe a little bit more how what we did in dojo with the heartbeat of the dojo being the pulse, which is basically two to four hours session of everything-ness, mm. or just everything can happen, mm. literally in connection with each other, responding to life that happens to us, for us, through us, in us, basically, mm -hmm. bringing it into connection. But in your own words, what's the dojo retreat? What's the work that you do there? Hmm. The dojo retreat is a very open, permissible space for expression, essentially. At its core, it's about like leaning into not knowing and feeling into truth hmm. and truth being a subjective interplay, not an objective interplay. It's a subjective interplay. So, we have that means everyone has his own truth basically. absolutely yeah everyone's holding a truth yeah so intersubjective truth is very intricate it's very complex and it's very interesting mm -hmm. and it's very beautiful mm. and but we're constantly trying to get to this umbrella objective truth between two people is very very difficult which always means i'm trying to sell you something you're trying to sell me something because we're trying to get to some kind of like understanding where we're both nodding and we're both mm. agreeing to something mm. but that's actually quite difficult especially mm -hmm. when it comes from authenticity mm -hmm. um, so the dojo basically was um, evolved and designed around liberation it's not to do with control it's not to do with controlling your emotions or controlling your mind no it's about liberating your mind liberating your emotions and it can be messy It can be messy because we have unschooled, unrealized, immature parts of us that are existing that, you know, we try to channel and we try to coerce into specific practices. Um, but there's a point where we need to be messy. We need to feel it's okay mm. because often they're attached to younger parts of us that didn't get a chance to express and that those parts can feel very abandoned by us, you know, and can feel let go of by mm. us. And there's a point where we need to feel baby rage, for example, like a raging, angry baby emotion and that that's okay. And it can be received on the mm -hmm. outside. So the, one of the key elements of the work is that everything is brought into connection. Mm -hmm. 
So essentially, it's giving permission to be able to show up more fully. And by permission, I'm not giving you permission. You're giving yourself permission. And what I mean by that is that we're often schooled, educated, coerced, um, manipulated, talked into, um, you know, parented into a certain way of being that's acceptable, is nice, and is functional mm. within a certain very, very, very na narrow bandwidth of behavior. And it's... It works for society, it works for parents, it works, it works, it works for education, etc. But it's to the detriment of everything else. Everything mm. else is denied because it's a discipline. And a discipline, you know, it works here, but it denies everything else. Mm. So there's a certain disciplinarian aspect to that, which fends off truth and more authenticity. And so expanding that and being giving us a possibility for a larger expression by feeling the permission of you know there there are a few there are a few rules here but not many um that there's nothing in your way of you know doing whatever saying whatever etc just your own moral compass your own guidance system around y your own behavior in the way that you show up or you don't show up mm -hmm. so there can become a kind of quandary inside oneself around yeah. oh wow i've just all of this construct has been lifted off mm. my shoulders mm. i feel way more free and yet i feel caged mm. i feel fucking caged mm -hmm. and the body becomes a cage in which we hold certain energies mm. so there's a pressure what i call a pressure differential which is inside of the body system energetic system nervous system emotional system there is a pressure and it's not being allowed to fully breathe mm. fully experience express itself and that can be joy it can be sexual energy it can be aggression or power it can be grief or sadness it can be many many things or the whole human gamut can be there mm. because we don't feel fully confident to be ourselves fully because we feel judged or whatever so in a situation where the, the pressure on the outside of the body can be equalized to that then there's a possibility for that to open as opposed to the pressure on the outside of the body feeling very constricted. And so it's much easier for us to hold that in our body because it feels like, oh, I can't do that because of this. I can't do that because of her or he or, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, uh, it enables a dilation and a deeper truth to be expressed. And then we just sit in a space and we wait and see what happens because it's very emergent. Mm. So nothing is planned, nothing is um, designed in some sense. And I'm responding and I'm inviting everyone to respond in the moment by moment experience of yeah. what's happening. Yeah. And then there was this gong and everyone mm -hmm. knew when the gong was rang, <laughs> things might just go really crazy. And there was this, you could feel this, this, this certain degree of respect towards that gong towards the pulse so it's mm. okay now we're starting mm -hmm. and at some point i mean i remember there's a photo even uh, of me really tapping in my full power thanks to you as well i mean mm. what you did for me in this dojo retreat I'll, i'll never forget that ever again you and james obviously the co-facilitator your dear friend um and everyone else who was present supporting and just being there and triggering the shit out of me at some point and It was fascinating to see there is an intelligence at work. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a greater, some kind of mystery that's unfolding moment by moment by moment. And through being in this container with people who are actually all in, like really committing to that, mm -hmm. um, you then start working with what is triggering you. Mm -hmm. Like just it's a woman who cries And there is a guy who gets triggered by her crying and starts shouting at her. And then there's me, since I was able to really connect to my full power the day before. And I felt, man, you can't do this. I jumped up and I said, stop it. Hmm. And he was big. He was bigger than me. He was strong. He was a guy who I would, you know, not approach on the street and say, hey, stop that. Hmm. And I was suddenly through, and that was again what she needed for her own process to feel safe and to feel cared for and to not feel alone. There is someone who steps up for you. Mm -hmm. And then this whole process started with this other guy where, where, where it took like three hours or something for him to go through that. And it's, <clears throat> it's very humbling to, to experience that in your own body how delicate life actually can be 
to show you what you need to see. And when then there is some certain degree of commitment to, I actually want to see what life wants to show me about myself so that I can be more free, more liberate, more myself, more showing up in the world. I think that's where the magic happens. And that's, that was for me maybe a very short description of what this week felt like for me and what I got out of it. And it has been life-changing. And I don't use that word lightly, hmm. but it, I have never experienced anything like that. Yeah. And it just takes a certain attunement. That's all it takes. There's a certain degree to which there's a container in which there's an amplification. Mm. So there's something is taken from what would be kind of a low level hum to quite a loud noise to a very loud noise. Mm. And there's the possibility then to hear it. There's a possibility then to see, feel and taste and touch it as opposed to it being ethereal or something that is on a kind of layer of reality that's quite like mm. mystical almost, it becomes very tangible mm -hmm. and very embodied. Mm -hmm. So what's happening there? What's happening there for me is that, that that's happening all of the time, mm -hmm. that we just don't give ourselves permission and we're not really attuning to what's happening. Mm -hmm. We're not using certain facets of our capacity in everyday life. And the main thing that we're doing is that we're taking ourselves away from um, concluding and knowing stuff because we're all the time knowing stuff. Mm -hmm. We have mastery over, we drive a bike, we go to the shop, we make a plan, we make a diary, we make structure, we do all of this stuff and it impinges the capacity for nature, for what n is naturally within you, what is naturally around you to work. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we start removing that and opening a different possibility, which is the ultimate possibility field, which is not knowing and leaning into the not knowing, which is an edge, it's always an edge in the not knowing, then what we might call magic happens. What, mm. what is called magic is essentially something we do not understand. Mm. As soon as we understand something, it no longer has that same quality of magic, it has a different quality of magic. It's something that we can put in our lexicon of things that we can mm. use in life as tools, which are inherently are magic. But as soon as we start disidentifying to what we know and leaning into what we don't know, that's in my experience, what happens, nature starts to work mm. and something else can be felt that's larger than us, that's greater than yeah. us, that is holding all of us, that we're all imbued in, we all have a part of, and yet it's, there's something that's at play that is beyond us. And for me, that is, is nature. Essentially, mm. you can call it the divine God, nature, mm. whatever you want, source. It's a powerful, powerful energy, but it requires a certain bow it requires a certain humility around not knowing and there are many times in that space i have no idea what's going on and that's the perfect place to be in because it invites my curiosity and it invites the possibility mm. it gives a certain openness to something so for someone listening and feeling resonance but you know Attending the dojo retreat is, might be a, a big leap for someone who has never been in touch with this kind of work or maybe Bali is too far away to, to travel to. The next one is beginning of July in Bali. Yeah. Um, but what could people apply some of the principles? Because you said like it's happening all the time, every moment of our life. Mm -hmm. Life is happening mm -hmm. basically through us, around us, in us. We're in, in, innately part of that. So how can we apply some of those principles into everyday life to become more attuned to our body, to the intelligence that's working in, uh, in ourselves, mm -hmm. um, to then get to the point that you just so, so beautifully described before, where you could start to resolve the issues you have with other people inside yourself, get the respect towards yourself, and then get the respect from the outside world, get tap into your own power and your potential and then be seen as someone who is in his power um, and all of this of the things what could be practically applied in everyday life of that well many things I mean it's there's a lot of different things that can be used I mean simple step is to just become self-aware what does that mean there's you know there are different 
kind of angles to that and there are different facets to self-awareness and it again it's nuanced and kind of complex but at the same time the simplicity of it is we get to examine ourselves that's self-awareness we get to explore ourselves and we're curious about ourselves we can feel we understand ourselves but often we're understanding a very limited aspect of ourselves mm. it's like anyone we go into a relationship with or we think we know you don't know them you, you can be 20 years with someone you really don't know them mm. you know and this is the surprise when people separate is the it's like shit i don't know you anymore and it's mm. like well that's often a very strong indicator that you concluded somebody way too soon and mm. by too soon i mean we can not conclude anything with anybody including ourselves ever mm. so you're co a constant unfolding new thing so be curious about yourself examine yourself like look at yourself in some sense not objectifying yourself but as an object that you can rotate and you can say oh wow this is a different facet and be curious when mm -hmm. something comes up don't go oh this is a thing that i don't like about myself it's like well that in itself is something when there's an edge when you feel uncomfortable there's something there for you and be curious about it be gentle with yourself and be curious with yourself in that um and we, you know, in relation to other people, that's really where a lot of things will come up. So mm. there's the kind of attunement to what's happening all around you all of the time mm. um, in the way that we interplay and interface with all of this. And all of this is holding a huge amount of information and metaphor. And again, we're taking very little of it in, really, because we have a particular path and we're not really slowing down, which mm. would be another thing. Just mm. slow down, slow everything down. And feel into actually like where is my authenticity what is my authenticity first of all and where is it in relation to somebody rather than going into something and then realizing well I don't really want to be doing this or you know I'm in, a, in an awkward position or you know I don't really un you know feel confusion or something along those lines just slow down it's really simple really when we slow things down then we get to kind of like get much more um attuned to the nuance of things um and we can start to kind of like really just start to tease open things that we would would we would have passed easily it's like going through a landscape in a car as opposed to walking when you're walking through a landscape you can feel it you can smell it you can touch it you can pause and examine and you know there's a huge amount just going on in one particular aspect of any part of nature you can spend a lot of time with that you know, but we, we rush past all sorts of things every day and we have to, we can't be interested in lots of detail all the time because well, we could do, yeah. we could get to know something, one garden intimately, as opposed to, oh, wow, I want to see India and Peru and, you know, mm. just get crazy for the world. That's, mm. you know, having a global sense of things also has a very profound effect on our way of pattern interrupting, which would be another one interrupt your own patterns if you've got a very strong way of doing something interrupt it and see what happens so for example if you've got a very long and strong morning practice anyone that i'm coaching who comes to me and says yeah i've got a three or four hour morning practice and i have to do it every day and then i say well what happens when you don't do it and they say can say something akin to well i feel off i feel you know i don't feel myself i don't feel it's a good it's not a good start to my day my invitation then is you need to stop your morning practice or my suggestion is stop your morning practice for at least a month don't do it and see what comes up because by doing that you're placating something that wants to live there's mm -hmm. something that wants to live it doesn't feel favorable to you so you're taming something there mm -hmm. you're coercing something there you're channeling something there and so interrupt your own patterns which is the beautiful thing about traveling is we interrupt our patterns. We go to a new country We're we're to a certain extent zeroed again around knowledge, language, currency. What's the right price for something? What do what's good to eat or drink? We're totally reorientating. So we have to titrate in and out of a new experience that gives us this exercise muscle building around appraising ourselves to not knowing mm. essentially so interrupt your own patterns would be another massive one that people mm. can to do and it doesn't have to be massive it's just do something in a different way you know if you're heavily into a routine mm. you know that's it's exactly the same you're mirroring your neural pathways your neural pathways are into a specific routine that makes sense 
that is very identified, that helps you feel safe and comfortable, mm. and it's very convenient because you can articulate it very easily. You don't get tongue-tied, you don't get mystified. You've got Google if you get lost. You know, you can look anything. We can farm out mm. our information seeking into our own, you know, computer cyborg device. But just interrupt the pattern of your life you'll see exactly the same thing you get probably eating the same thing you like for breakfast and the same way you walk to work or the same things that you do in relationship or the same way that you enjoy having sex or whatever it is do something else mm. and in that you'll start to rejig it things will slowly start to rejig you'll go off off road you'll mm. suddenly be in a not knowing situation yeah. And that enables us to start to stretch ourselves and dilate ourselves. And it yeah. doesn't feel comfortable at first. It can feel threatening even or unsafe. Mm. And there's a thing. Sure. And you've been traveling for a very long time in your life, right? You lived with tribes in Borneo. And yeah. You have really you know, dived deep into different cultures and countries. And what has, what has, has this given you in your life? Um, many things. And at the time, I didn't realize what it was giving me, really. Mm. I was curious. Mm. And I wanted to learn directly from my experience. And I didn't realize on a deeper level what I was learning, which was facets of not knowing and so mm. on. Um, surrender would be another massive one. Um, but yeah, I traveled since I was 17. And then between the age of 20 and 36, pretty much I traveled continuously and was working all over the world and traveling. And I was going in and out of Egypt and India and um, Honduras and Central America and Southeast Asia and I was constantly moving also I was you know that was you know empowering and also disempowering in many ways because I was running for myself I wouldn't you know as soon as I felt uncomfortable in a situation I'd try and move on and I'd try and outwit things but things of course you know I couldn't run for myself it's an an obvious adage but I learned the hard way <laughs> and so I ended up you know in in kind of I, I, I would do the s simplest, cheapest form of traveling that I could possibly do. So I would last the longest period of time. So I would stay in the crappiest rooms in India with, you know, like a cell. Um, I would eat only on the street. I would never eat in a cafe, even in local cafe. I'd always eat street food because it was the cheapest. And as a consequence, you know, I'd end up in these situations where I, I would be lying in a horrible hotel somewhere in some innocuous town somewhere in India, just feeling alone and devastated and like I couldn't engage with life. And, you know, my shadow was really imbued in me mm. and I would have I've had many dark nights of the soul, like, mm. you know, awake almost all night, just feeling like I've messed my life up. I can't face reality. I don't even know what my truth is, you know, and everything kind of catching up on me mm -hmm. in that way. And it's been, you know, trial by fire in that, in that respect as well. Mm. Um, but simply putting myself in different situations, in different people's perspectives, you know, if, um, working with street kids in India or being in slums in Jakarta or, you know, just being curious and tasting different lifestyles. So my brother was working for a very rich guy in Miami. So I got to kind of taste that lifestyle and fly in private planes and all of this kind of stuff. And then I had the thing in India and then I got friends, you know, who are aristocrats and I've got friends who are very humble and simple lives and they're very content. And that again interrupted this pattern around these are my people those are not mm. my people it was like no everyone has something to teach mm. and seeking out kind of gurus or situations where i was learning from some kind of master or something became less relevant mm. than more that i was getting mastered by life so everyone had something amazing and intimate and incredible mm. to share Beautiful. and then the life or the country itself, mm. like India has been one of my greatest teachers and I went there to kind of seek out ashrams and all of mm. that stuff. Mm. And what happened was the country itself became the teacher mm -hmm. and the more I surrendered into the experience and mm. open to India as a form, the more I learned about, you know, um, letting go of things, um, not holding on to, you know, time frames or schedules, um, being able to interface with situations that are very very confronting like a lot of the time you'll be eating and there's a child coming up with no legs you know on a little skateboardy thing and pulling at your trouser leg begging 
you know, and then you give, maybe you give something to them and then another one will come and another one and another, and you're soon, you're like, wow, I can, you know, if I start giving to everybody that needs it, or I talk to everybody that wants to, to have my attention, I'm going to feel drained. Mm. So how do I create right relationship with this without feeling that I'm somehow limiting my experience mm. or defending myself against something that I can't face? And at the same time, holding a boundary that is intelligent yeah. and responsive to what's yeah. happening around me. Yeah. So yeah, there's so much and to learn. Finding that's that's I guess is, is an essential part of finding your own truth. That, like what works for you doesn't mean works for me. But finding that through experience, through being with life, being intimate with life in all the different facets and aspects, and situations and experiences mm -hmm. is what ultimately then leads to what you just so beautifully described, like being mastered by life. I feel like we have oftentimes we have this high performance attitude of I want to master life. Mm -hmm. Good luck. <laughs> right. Good. I want to master my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't believe that there's my life in your life. Yeah. You know, like, you know, my body, your body, my mm. brain, your brain, that's mm -hmm. kind of clear. Mm. you know but my life your life there for me there is only life and we're mm. capturing parts of life and we're interfacing with that and ma the idea of master my life mastery and mastering life is for me feels ridiculous mm -hmm. in a way you know because there's a thing where people say oh he or she's larger than life and what they really mean is that they're larger than my life they're looking at a particular person who has a particular energy or way of interfacing with reality mm. or with the world mm. or with life in a way that's, that appears to be larger and more expressive than theirs. That's all they mean because you can't be larger than life. It's yeah. not possible. Yeah. So when someone says that, it means that you're larger than my life because mm. I've limited my life and I'm looking at you from a contracted place and I'm like, how the hell can you dance so freely, for example? What you can be is larger with life. Mm. That's possible. We can interface with life, be penetrated by life, be mastered by life and become larger with it. Mm. But to master it and become larger than it is not possible. We mm. can't become larger than life. It's, it's an impossibility. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like these plants over here being mastered by life and blooming into their full expression of what they are mm -hmm. would not thinking of looking exactly like the other plant next to them and every plant being a, an authentic expression of their true nature mm -hmm. and that's the potential that's there for us as well sure yeah. yeah and we have a potential beyond plants and beyond animals because we have no top line mm -hmm. so anything that's you know succumb to an evolutionary path um physiologically like we're very much hardwired into evolution. So for a plant to become more complex or a bird to you know, develop a bill or whatever it is, it takes a long fucking time, like thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But human beings, we have this incredible privilege that we're not just sentient, we're sapient. And sapience is the fact that we learn from our interactions and we learn from our mistakes and we have the capacity to retain information and evolve with that information which is epigenetics essentially mm -hmm. we can also turn on certain genes within our body system we can turn off certain genes within our body system and therefore we can evolve and we can we can we've got a lot of wiggle room that enables us to have you know the same person can have two very different lives just from choice making mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have this immense privilege that we, we, we is, a pr is a blessing and a curse because it's also fantastically disabling because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so big now and so present and so possible that people can feel a lot of pressure and get crushed under it as well. So this idea around purpose, soul purpose and all of this, these things that you hear a lot of people talking about this desperate need for purpose, like mm -hmm. I need to be on purpose and I don't know what my purpose is. It's an awful lot of pressure, especially when we can do anything. If you have a median amount of intelligence and you have a possibility to interface with the structural th um, things that society have set up in order for us to create things and do things, then you, know, you can point yourself in any direction and probably do that. 
and that has disabled a lot of people from doing anything because mm. they have this sense that they could be this and they could be this and they could be this and it becomes a very very difficult thing it's the same in relationships with you know there's a myriad of people out there a myriad of possibilities and because we've we've got unlimited choice mm. we tend to you know not stay in a particular relationship very long because as soon as there's a problem or there's mm. some kind of challenge we can jump ship into another relationship because there's this endless appetite for something new and novelty and all of that kind of stuff mm. and so it's a blessing in terms of our capacity to learn and it can be a curse and i think we're witnessing it now in the amount of depression going on mm. in um modern um society in terms of like developed society mm. um because in the, the developing world or however you want to frame most of the world like 85 percent of the world they don't have a choice most people are doing what they need to do or what their father or mother did and it's very convenient because mm. you accept that it's your dharma it's etc etc yeah. and a hundred years ago we used to accept that but now we have dreams we have plans we have possibilities and um you know for some people some very few lucky people they get to do exactly what they want in a way that has currency uh, for a lot of people they don't mm. they don't get to do that they they get to actually fold into something that doesn't really fulfill them mm. to the detriment of a childhood dream that, that remains unrealized you know which is a, a tremendous sad sadness and and yeah. um tr a tremendous loss mm. you know massive loss And that brings me to, uh, I think, a, a, a nice wrap up of this conversation. What's what's alive for you? What kind of dream is there for you, or vision, or some direction you you'll be taking in the next few years? Is that something that's alive for you, or are you just navigating with the flow and seeing where life takes you? Um, yeah, what's alive for me is to continue this work, mm -hmm. and by continuing it, it's not a form, it's not something formulaic. I want to evolve it and mm. change it. And it evolves every time new people come and interface with the work. It mm. it feeds the work in some sense as an mm. entity. Yeah. Not that it is an entity in itself, but it's just nature informing itself. So it evolves and changes. And I, I hope in 10 years it's unrecognizable. It mm. should be. Mm. Like if I'm doing in any way the right thing, it should be unrecognizable. And also it's completely open source. So ultimately teachings in to a degree, but there's a, there's always this notion of um, a capacity to have worked through enough of your own stuff to be functional within the framework of the work mm. so that's one thing around allowing the work to breathe and to be its own thing and to evolve mm. <clears throat> and another massive thing for me is space place geographical space mm. i'm getting older and not tired but i feel i want to build physical space in order to house this work mm -hmm. and you know and other work similar to this like innovative groundbreaking to a degree self-development self-actualized work where we're working with nature um and i've got a design for that that i'm working on um, which is like a temple complex of five different experiential spaces um that will be built maybe in costa rica maybe here i don't know yet exactly But that's a massive project for me mm. is to have a physical base in order to be able to really empower this work and to have it more yeah um the the energetic of it being kind of like imbued in a space that can hold it as well so we're not just going into a, a space designed or held by somebody else and you know kind of like like passengers kind of riding on that for one for a while that there's a space specifically de designed um and that it's yeah it's ready to to kind of amplify what's needed to be amplified so beautiful. that's kind of a big project for me beautiful yeah. and i'm excited to see you there at some point in the future yeah sure it was not my last dojo retreat no. highly recommended to anyone who's interested in that work and the things you share today yeah. thank you so much for thank being you. on the podcast thank you for sharing thank about. you for having me yeah yeah it's been beautiful yeah Thank you for also inviting us, you know, into personal stories and being so upfront and honest and authentic about still being who you are today with all that you've been through and owning that. And that's yeah. deeply inspiring to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mehr über Tom Slater und das Dojo Retreat erfährst du unter den Links in den Show Notes. Schreib mir auf Instagram at jakob.horvath, was du dir aus der Folge mitnimmst oder gerne auch, wenn du irgendwo vielleicht auch anderer Meinung bist. Ich freue mich über angeregte und konstruktive Diskussionen in den Kommentaren. Teile die Folge mit Menschen, die sie ebenfalls hören sollen. Sehr, 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 sehr gerne. Abonniere den Podcast und schreibe uns eine 5 sterne bewertung auf iTunes. Wenn du 1000 First Steps gerne direkt unterstützen möchtest, kannst du mich einmal im Monat umgerechnet auf einen Cappuccino mit Hafermilch einladen. Und wie das geht, das zeige ich dir auf soulbase.jakobhorvath.com. Damit unterstützt du meine Arbeit und hilfst mir dabei, die Software, das technische Equipment und mehr zu finanzieren. Den Link ebenfalls in den Show Notes. Wir hören uns in zwei Wochen wieder, wenn du möchtest. Ich freue mich auf dich. Schön, dass du dabei warst heute und bis bald. Ich wünsche dir eine gute Zeit und nur das Beste. Dein Jakob.